From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Yes, it's been quite a summer. Rent cars and westbound trains. Those the lyrics of Mr. Jimmy Buffett in his first ever top 40 single, Come Monday, released 45 years ago in 1974 on his Livin' and Dyin' and Three Quarter Time album. I never did get to a Buffett concert this summer. Dang. But it's been quite a summer here at the New York Stock Exchange, too, at a pace far faster than Three Quarter Time, hitting me like a John Candelaria fastball high and tight with memories flying at me from all angles. July 26th, first data. NYSE ticker symbol FD rings the closing bell on its last day of trading after being acquired by Fiserv, its CEO, Frank Bizignano, the guy I worked for for many years, walking off into the sunset after doubling the price of his stock just under four years after his IPO. Then there's August. I'm in Europe, toting along the book by Blackstone founder Steve Schwartzman. You heard our conversation with him a few weeks back, the resounding story of betting it all with Pete Peterson to found what is now the world's largest alternative asset manager. Then, September, another mentor, Joe Plumeri, an early guest of this show, declares to me, Josh, I'm going to Israel. And that's where he is as I talk to you today, exploring Masada, swimming in the Dead Sea, and venturing to the Golan Heights and Petra on a pilgrimage long overdue. And just last week, here at the NYSE, At our NYSC American Emerging Company Summit, there's Jeff Solomon, the CEO of Cowan Group, ticker symbol C-O-W-N, offering the keynote to other CEOs whose companies are thriving and entering into the public markets. Bizignano, Schwarzman, Plumeri, Solomon, what's the tie that binds? Shearson Lehman Brothers, Wall Street in its heyday, the 1980s and 90s, RJR Nabisco, Barbarians of the Gate, the time of Sandy Weil, Jim Robinson, and Peter Cohen. One day, getting ready for a charity benefit, Bizignano asked me to come over to his house to look at some old mementos from his days at Shearson, a place where giants once roamed. He showed me an old VHS video of a company softball outing, Peter Cohen's Cohen Heads against Tony DeMeo's Paisanos, the Jews against the Italians, with Bizignano at shortstop and Plumeri captaining the squad in a friendly game on the diamond. The boys of Wall Street, it was so innocent back then. No matter the outcome, Cohen's legend only grew from there. He and Jeff Solomon from Pittsburgh's Squirrel Hill by way of UPenn would go on to form Ramius in 1994, the pair building it into one of the country's largest privately held hedge funds, then merging it into publicly held Cowan in June 2009, the deal valued at about $195 million. Jeff Solomon's journey from Squirrel Hill to Wall Street by way of Emma Kaufman Camp in Cheat Lake, West Virginia, and the core values of a CEO and the firm he leads right after this. And now a word from Arthur Bergman, CEO of Fastly. NYSE ticker symbol FSLY. Fastly is an edge cloud platform. We help deliver digital experiences for amazing customers like Spotify and Ticketmaster and New York Times. We have started eight years ago. It's been an amazing journey. We work very closely with our customers. We're a very critical part in their business. And we're very selective in the type of customers we want in our network. Fastly is built by developers for developers. Fastly is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Joining us today is Jeffrey Solomon, chairman and CEO of investment firm Cowan Inc. Jeff's been with the firm since his firm, Ramius, merged with Cowan in 2009, serving first as its chief strategy officer, then head of investment banking, chief operating officer, president, and now chief executive officer. In addition to running Cowan, Jeff's also the vice chairman and inaugural member of the Security and Exchange Commission's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee, 
providing advice and counsel on commission rules, regulations, and policy matters related to smaller public companies and small businesses, the work that brought him here to the NYSC last week. No stranger to this building. Welcome, Jeff, inside the Ice House. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So what's your first memory of this place? Oh, wow. When I first came to work here, I, in a million years, never imagined that I'd ever be anywhere close to this building. I mean, growing up in Pittsburgh, we talked about the stock market. We certainly heard what was going on every day. But the idea that I could be working anywhere proximity to New York Stock Exchange would, you know, I just, that wasn't something I ever really thought about. And when I got here, uh, I remember during my first uh, few weeks of work, I used to work over at the World Financial Center. Like, I felt like I had to make a pilgrimage. And so my first, you know, memory of it is just standing right outside uh, on Wall Street, uh, standing up at that and going, I can't, I can't believe this is me. I can't believe I'm part of this. Uh, it's tr- tremendously iconic. By the way, I get the same feeling every time I walk in here. So, I mean, Bizignano talks about sitting on the steps of Federal Hall with a salami sandwich in his hand just looking at the building. But, you know, I think of that image of the Pisanos against the Cohen heads. Does that bring back memories for you? Because those were your first years. So they were. You know, Shearson was a really big firm. Although it's interesting. Like, I spent some time with Frank. I spent some time with Joe Plumeri. Uh, certainly, I spent a lot of time with Peter. And so I remember that um, those leaders at that time. And, you know, I was deeply impressionable. I was in my early 20s, and uh, I didn't know really anything about how everything worked. Uh, and I remember that almost across the board, people took me under their wing and, and were more than willing to teach and mentor me, educate me, tell me about things that, you know, I, I you know, again, would never have been able to comprehend how things worked. Uh, and it was just fascinating for me. And so, again, early on, I just I remember being a part of this and feeling like I was on a, a great team, uh, certainly at Shearson Lehman in the early days. That's for sure. I mean, I, I've heard you talk about developing the S1 for a big capital raise at Shearson and literally going around the company and understanding how it's basically a collection of small firms. That, that's, you know, it was and it was. I mean, Shearson's. Uh, was was really made out of a series of acquisitions. I didn't really fully appreciate that at the time, but you know, I was an M and A banker. I you know, started as a corporate finance analyst. I focused on M and A. I will I'll be candid with you. I don't even think I knew what M and A meant when I applied for the job, but I got it. Hey, are you Penn? You took the ride up to Manhattan. It's an easy place. It's an easy way to get to. Yeah, you know, but I was I was not in Wharton, so I I, I was a college arts and sciences kid. I was a theater minor and an economics major. And I was just literally, you know, uh, it sounds so uh, old fashioned to say this. I was putting my resume in boxes and I somehow or another got it in the Shearson M&A box. And I and I got a job, uh, which was great. Uh, and, and, and the learning that went on in that first two years of my career was intense. But, you know, you mentioned, you know, how things, you know, sort of progressed with my understanding of the business as it, uh, now that I run. Uh, and it's it really started in those in those first two years because I got lucky enough to be on that internal corporate finance team. And during the time we were going to do a public offering, I got the chance to draft the S1 that basically talked about what the firm does in detail. And I could go around to each of the various businesses and actually learn. Again, I was just doing my job, but the absorption uh, of information about how firms, you know, big firms like Shearson ran at the time is is huge. And it's hugely valuable. I still use that stuff today. So let me see if I get this straight. Abraham and Sarah Kaufman lived in Germany and had eight children, six sons, two daughters. The sons, Jacob, Isaac, Henry, and Morris, all immigrated to Pittsburgh. They formed Kaufman's, which eventually rolled up into Macy's, NYSC ticker symbol M, and your summer camp was named for Isaac's first wife, Emma. Emma, Emma Kaufman. Yes, that is that is true. Though. Look, what the Kaufman family did for Pittsburgh and the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, uh, for really my great-grandparents' generation. So my great-grandparents' generation uh, sort of came to this country. Uh, They settled all over the country, but ultimately ended up in in Pittsburgh. And what the Kaufmans did in Pittsburgh was really create a place where Eastern European Jews could congregate and could have social services. It wasn't like the Jewish community was a particularly wealthy uh, community, at least not uh, from my, you know, my side. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I, ev- almost everything we did, I, I played at the Irene Kaufman uh, Settlement or the Irene Kaufman Center. You know, I went to Emma Kaufman Camp. I went to the Henry Kaufman Family Park. I mean, everything we did uh, socially uh, was around the Kaufman family. I mean, I think about that now. T- tremendous impact on my life. I never knew them. Like, I think about that a lot when, when I do my own philanthropy, you know, 
one of the great things is I get to do philanthropy. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have have made enough where I can make a little bit of an impact. And uh, one of the things I love is that I'm, I'm probably making an impact in the lives of people I'll never know. Uh, and just the same way that the Kaufman family did for me and my family. What was it like for you, your parents around the dinner table? They said, you know, it's, it's going to be hot here in Pittsburgh in the summer. We're going to send you to the Emma Kaufman summer camp for the first time. I don't know what age you were, but you must have tracked it all the way to the last possible year that you could have attended. Yeah, I, you know, I went my first summer camp. Uh, I was homesick. I was really not happy. I, we, we spent most of our summers at the swim uh, at the swim club, the Henry Kaufman Family Park. I swam on the swim team. I, I had a good thing going there. My parents decided it was great to send me to camp. I didn't really want to go because, you know, I was like, well, why I'm having fun here? Why would I want to do that? And I missed home. And I, you know, sort of early FOMO, I think, is really looking back on it was the thing that made me homesick. It's not that I didn't like being at camp. I just didn't like the idea that I was missing things that were going on, you know, back home. And, you know, that that was a critical moment for me in retrospect uh, to learn how to adjust to a new environment and a new situation and not worry about what's happening outside of your view. You know, that's a big transitional thing. And I would say if I had my parents hadn't made me do that uh, or come to get me when I was complaining about how homesick I was, I'm not sure I ever would have moved to New York. I mean, I just and so I just think even at a very basic level, my experiences at summer camp uh, you know, taught me how to be resilient as an individual. I mean, you've said in the past, I think that you had some difficulty with transition and change and you've got to be the change. And you show up in a summer camp like I did up in Maine, nine other kids, 11 other kids that you don't know. And, you know, you're either going to be backed into a corner or you're going to lead this group someplace else. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm a big believer that the, the, the fear of change is, that, is mostly when change happens to you. Right? And, and I think that's that's with me and that's with a lot of people. And so in my career and in my life, I've tried to be the agent of change. I feel better about change when I'm the one that's actually bringing it about than when it's happening to me. And it hasn't always worked out. I mean, change comes and sometimes you're just not prepared for it. But, you know, I think the ethos that I've developed over the course of my career is predicated on this idea that we need to create change uh, in order to uh, not have it happen to us. Uh, and maybe that's a false sense of, control. I don't know, uh, because, you know, I'm just trying to I'm trying to do some things where I can make an impact uh, as opposed to have them happen to me. But it's something I, I think then is critical to any business endeavor. Uh, change is a constant. It's always going to happen. And, you know, I think in whatever you're doing, you've got to be out in front of it. Change is one powerful word. Another single powerful word is outperform. I look at your website and I see the proud name Cowan and the one word lockup outperform. You beat Apple with think different. That's two words. You beat Nike. Just do it. That's three words. One word outperform. That raises the bar as high as it can go. Why use that word? Well, I think it's, you know, it's why everybody comes to work every day. It doesn't matter what you do. Right. I, I, I've said in uh, I've never been in a meeting one time with anybody in my entire career where they said, I'm OK, be an average not an investor, not a company, not somebody who starts uh, a job. They don't come in and say, hey, I'm just, are you cool with me being average? Nobody does that. And so this idea that um, so much of what happens in our capital markets today is okay with average. I mean, nothing against passive investing. It's just you're shooting for the average. Mm -hmm. And when we decided, you know, what are we doing at Cowan that's differentiated? Well, everything we do at Cowan is geared towards helping people to do better than average, to outperform. Uh, in hedge fund speak, it's to generate alpha. Yeah. That's really what we do in every aspect of our business. And so the simplicity of just saying we come in every day to help other people outperform. You think about ETFs, baskets of huge stocks, which basically are an average at the end of the day. You think about this long bull market that we've been on since essentially Ramius did its merger with Cowan in 2009. And I've heard you say, you know, it's, you'd love to outperform, you'd love to put all your capital at play, but we're still waiting for this big end to this bull market. Yeah, I mean, I think every every market is a different market. You know, this one has been a slower growing, longer lasting uh, recovery. 
but then again, what presaged it was a much more of a cataclysm than anything we'd seen in our careers, at least I, I'd seen in my career over the last 30 years. And so, you know, you, you're not, I'm not surprised that this one has lasted longer and that some of the excesses that were created between 2000 and 2008 were not recreated here. It's also radically different. We have never at any other time had so many um, individuals in the United States have so much of their net worth in the equity market. Uh, it's become extremely accessible for everybody in America. And that has fueled this growth and probably helps to keep it persistent for some time. I, I think I'm a big believer in demographics. We, we have boomers just beginning to enter the retirement uh, phase, and they've, they've recognized that their earning power on the whole uh, isn't necessarily satisfactory to live out their lives as they thought. And so their reliance on having uh, value in their equity accounts and, and, and in their investment accounts is, is critical. And so there's this uh, underpinning of well, everybody does better if the, if the stock market does better. Uh, and I, I think that's true. And so uh, to me, this, this could go on uh, for a while. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it will. I don't have a crystal ball. But, you know, we didn't have this giant... Um, you know, uh, we didn't have this giant buildup of uh, of uh, or debt laden buildup like we had in the previous uh, in the previous decade. And so, you know, I think people will be um, y using their life savings. I'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that you know they're going to continue to plow money into the equity market the way they have. But but you know, when you look at the the flow of funds, uh, I'm, I'm not looking at a cliff somewhere. I went back and read that article, June 4th, 2009, New York Times, Cowan Group to merge with Ramius. It said, Mr. Cohen, who ran Shearson Lehman Brothers in the 1980s, said the investment banking business was in many ways going back to the future as Wall Street morphs back into a collection of firms. It mentioned Evercore, which is our neighbor in our Midtown office, Perella Weinberg and Greenhill. Was back to the future what was going on for you guys back in 2009? Well... You know, uh, yes, we were totally, I mean, for me and Peter, for sure, and for Tom Strauss and Morgan Stark, our other two partners, I mean, we came from that part of the business. Um, they spent a lot more time in it than I did. Uh, and so this idea of, of really uh, going back a, a, to a sell-side investment bank uh, was very much back to the future for us. Um, what I will say is, we had a view that to, that the growth in Wall Street firms and the bigger firms weren't exactly serving the needs of the buy side, uh, at least from our standpoint, exactly what we, they weren't doing exactly what we needed them to do for us. And so with this idea, we could create an investment bank, uh, which was kind of the investment bank we wish had always covered us when, when, when we're clients. That, that was sort of the idea behind it. Um, you know, I would say when you look at the market share that we've taken and the things we're doing, that is what Callan is today in many respects. It's just it's picked a group of clients, both corporate clients and investors and uh, allocators of capital, uh, all of whom want the same thing. Uh, and our goal is to make sure we align the resources of the firm to deliver for that uh, uh, for them on a consistent basis. So that transaction was June 2009. Dicey period. Barack Obama, Tim Geithner, Ben Bernanke, Steve Ratner, a new economic team just getting its feet wet in the middle of a historic crisis. Was combining with Cowan a move that you had the vision for, or was it at the time just an effort of sheer survival? Just let's hear a clip from back then. Now, under this framework, we are establishing three new programs to clean up and strengthen the nation's banks, to bring in private capital to restart lending, and to go around the banking system directly to the markets that consumers and businesses depend on. Let me describe each of these three steps. First, we're going to require banking institutions to go through a carefully designed, comprehensive stress test. This borrows the medical term. We want their balance sheets cleaner and stronger, and we're going to help this process by providing a new program of capital support. I mean, it was one of the toughest days in Secretary Geithner's life. Suddenly, the glare of the cameras on a guy who's basically been behind the scenes for most of his career. But for people who are just starting a, a new venture in a firm, an enormous ocean of opportunity with this massive correction right behind you. Yeah, we, we certainly thought that... Um that the political winds would sort of play out in such a way that the bigger banks would not reamass the capital 
uh, as quickly or be able to run these integrated businesses. I, we were wrong about that. I mean, I, the, the uh, amazement of how quickly they were able to repair their balance sheets in retrospect, given the uh, quantitative easing and the actions from the central bank, uh, I mean, I, it helped to repair those balance sheets you know, pretty quickly. Uh, and Dodd-Frank, which, is an, which was important, isn't nearly as far-reaching as I think we thought it would be. But that's not why we did Cowan. You know, and I think a lot of people think that, oh, you know, you thought you were going to take share from all these big banks. No, no, we just felt that there was a segment of the marketplace mm-hmm. for smaller uh, institutions like ourselves and, and, and middle market clients that just wasn't being well served. And, and by the way, we still think it's not particularly well served by some of the bigger financial institutions. Nothing against them. I have a lot of friends that work there. I'm friends with a lot of people that run those firms. They just they're focused on much bigger transactions uh, with bigger corporations. And we're focused on more family owned entrepreneurial, smaller middle market businesses where, you know, you actually need to engage and then be able to deliver. And uh, and so it's both this idea that you can develop a deep relationship and have top quality execution that's at the center of what we do. That's what we thought, um, you know, and in and, and, and retrospect, it, it looks as if we had this great uh, idea that we could basically take share from all the big banks because it happened around the same time. That's not what was in our mind at the time. We just thought, here's Cowan. It's a really interesting brand. It's a really, it's a sleepy company that no one, no one really remembered. Uh, I, I certainly hadn't thought about Cowan in a long time. And for us at Ramius, we had made some other strategic decisions that put us in a position where we had capital and that we could take that capital, monetize that capital, or permanentize that capital by merging with, with Cowan that was public. And and then this idea of being able to, you know, uh, break the traditional uh, buy side, sell side regime for how people look at the business, that came in the first two years. We said, okay, let's not look at the world that way. Let's just look at the world as, you know, those who care about active management and outperformance and those who don't. And when you look at it that way, you know, buy side, sell side, we're all in that same ecosystem of trying to figure out how to create outperformance. And that was really a 2011 or 2012 idea that really played itself out, you know, in the last half a decade. Played itself out in the last half a decade. We are 10 years on from that time in 2009 when you started that effort. My friend David Morehouse, who's now CEO of the Pittsburgh Penguins, moved back to your hometown from Washington to work for Ron Burkle and Mario Lemieux as they were buying and rebuilding the pens and the area around PPG Paints Arena, a classic urban development success story, something I'm sure you've gone back and see unfolding before your eyes. I got a couple of Stanley Cups in my in my belt. Thanks to Lemieux and Morehouse and that gang. That's great. I'm hugely indebted to them and you know Rutherford and the crew. What have you seen in Pittsburgh from sort of its nadir and the leaner years to when you go back home today and you see you know, the way someone was saying, you know, traffic is pretty difficult there. You know, Pittsburgh is a, is a great story. It's on its third renaissance. I mean, just think about that. It's third renaissance. The first renaissance really happened when, they, you know, post-World War uh, II, when the city really needed to clean itself up. It was a pretty dirty, grungy city. You know, the heart, heartbeat was really all about steel and manufacturing. You know, the, the apex for, for manufacturing and steel was like 1960, uh, which is six years before I was born. So I was born kind of, you know, just before the second Renaissance. And if you, if you lived in Pittsburgh in the 70s, you know, everyone thinks about the Steelers and the Pirates and the Super Bowls and the City of Champions and, and you know, the, the World Series victories. That was definitely happening. But what was also happening is we had one in five Pittsburghers out of work mm-hmm. by the end of that decade. And the cataclysmic fall of the, U- of the U.S. steel industry had a deep toll on the region. And... You know, what are you to do about that? This is a classic example we talked about earlier. Change happened, right? Foreign steel became a reality. The rest of the world uh, really finally got its act together, particularly in Asia after the Second World War, and began to produce uh, competitive product, cars and steel. And we in Pittsburgh weren't prepared for that. Uh, or we pretended, or you know, the senior leadership and some of the companies pretended like it wasn't happening, and it happened. The, the uh, leadership politically at that time said, listen, we love this place, and we're not going to let it go away. And the second renaissance was all about uh, figuring out how to do job retraining and attract 
uh, new businesses, meds and eds, right? Mm-hmm. The biggest employers in the state of, in the city of Pittsburgh today are hospitals uh, and uh, and universities. Yep. Carnegie. And bringing in uh, talent uh, and recruiting. I mean, actively recruiting to come and live in this lifestyle and changing the perception so that by the time I left in 1984, Pittsburgh was the most livable city in America. Five years, five years after, you know, U.S. Steel or Jones and Lachlan went bankrupt, you know, U.S. Steel pretty much left the city and and Jones and Lachlan went bankrupt. That's a huge uh, feather in the cap of, of leadership. So what do I take away from that? You know, I knew Mayor Caligiuri because he lived in my town. I went to high school with his children. How do you not admire that effort and that uh, foresight? Uh, And so I think Pittsburgh exists today because of leaders like Mayor Caligiuri and the city council who made really hard decisions to transform the city. And, uh, and so today it's one of the, it's a hundred percent one of the most livable cities uh, in America. I, my parents are still there. My in-laws are still there. My, my kids still go to Emma Coffin camp, by the way. And so we're there all the time. And I, I look at it with this, uh, you know, um, amazing sense of pride. And I think a lot of people of, of us who live in the Pittsburgh diaspora feel the same way. So, Jeff, you were here last week as the keynote speaker for the NYSC American Emerging Companies Summit, which celebrates American companies, like many in Pittsburgh, thriving and entering into the public markets. What did you want to make sure the audience took away from your talk? You know, that the public markets are still available for you if you've got a valuable business model. Uh, And that it's not for everybody, but... Uh, for companies that really want to have a growth initiatives where the amount of capital they need to raise outstrips their ability to raise it in the private market, they should be looking at accessing the public markets. And this is really, it's never been easier for smaller companies, uh, or hasn't been this easy in quite some time uh, for smaller companies to get access to capital, certainly post the JOBS Act. And I wanted to leave everybody with this sense that, um, you know, certainly in Washington, D.C. today, maybe, maybe more than any other time I've been going there, uh, we are focused on how to create a marketplace in which you know capital providers can meet uh, capital uh, needers uh, in a way to create value, valuable companies, create jobs, create private sector growth, and that exists today. And I think sometimes uh, you know media gets hung up in some of the big tech challenges or the big tech new issues. The reality is the smaller companies are actually the ones uh, that are making it happen for America for mm-hmm. the American economy by and large. And uh, you know, the fact that the stock exchange is focused on how to bring capital into those companies, I want to be a part of that dialogue for sure. This year, you were appointed vice chairman and an inaugural member of the SEC's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee. So, Jeff, what's the purpose of the committee and your role in providing advice on commission rules, regulations, and policy? Yeah, it's an amazing thing. So, again, not something that gets a lot of attention, but in, in 2016, Congress uh, and the president formed, uh, you know, actually passed a law that said we're going to empower the SEC to focus on small business capital formation, defined as companies that are $250 million in market cap and lower, private and public, um, with this idea that that um, that's really the breadbasket of our country. And so many of the small companies really are providing the economic growth engine for individuals. Um, and they not only created this office, but they cre- created um, an advisory committee, which is the one that I'm on, uh, a small business advocate who we also met last week, Martha Miller, who's doing an amazing job. I mean, she's incredible. She comes from Birmingham. Yeah. She's got a real strong sense as to what it's like to advise small businesses. And, and she's brought a really a great energy into the SEC. I, I made a comment when I was there for my last meeting. I'm like, I can't remember the SEC being so happy. I'm thrilled to be on that committee because I think it's a committee that can actually solve a lot of challenges. Uh, and it's a, in the, the symbiosis between this advisory committee and what we're seeing in corporation finance uh, is really productive. The, the idea that you can streamline rules and regulations to make it easier for small companies to raise money without squandering investor protection. And I think the fear that everybody had, certainly I heard about it a lot during the Jobs Act, and every time somebody touches some of the regulations, the big fear is that it's going to hurt small investors. And, and the answer is it, it doesn't have to. 
the idea that you can bring uh, risk capital in and allow small investors to participate in the growth of small companies is at the center of the JOBS Act with crowdfunding. And we need to have a regulatory regime that allows uh, small investors to continue to be able to participate in that because they're missing out. It, you know, one of the things that's happened with passive investing is if, you're, if your entire portfolio is in passive funds, you're not participating in any new issue. No IPOs, because those funds do not participate in IPOs. So it's not only that individuals don't own stocks anymore, they don't own funds that own Mm -hmm. new companies. And so now I hear this lament, well, you know, uh, you know, it's it, all of the wealth is being created by VCs and, you know, and, and, and private investors. And the answer is, yeah, because we scared the little investor away post 2000. Right. And that little investor is now doing very different things that have nothing to do with capital formation. So one of the things we're doing is, OK, how do we bring them back in mm-hmm. in a very safe way? We cannot go back to some of the bad stuff that happened. Nobody's in favor of that. But we have to create a regime in which it's safe for investors to take appropriate risks. Not all of them will work out. Not all of them will work out. But the ones that do will more than pay for the ones that don't. One of the areas of great promise, of course, is biotechnology stocks. The New York Stock Exchange, along with the Securities and Exchange Commission, has been working hard to create a new on-ramp for biotech companies to access capital. It's a topic that we've covered on this podcast a few times in recent weeks. Cowan's working extensively in this industry. Are you seeing an impact from these changes to get to allow biotech companies to access capital earlier and easier? Yeah, I mean, it's been one of the uh, industries that's benefited most from the Jobs Act, probably the industry that's benefited most. Why? Because it's capital intensive. So if you think about what's happening in our economy, you go back 20 years, uh, we used to fund companies privately that were capital intensive, and we built things here. Now we don't. We fund companies that are software companies and and service companies. And frankly, those are not capital intensive. The whole VC community has pivoted its business model to financing companies that are capital light. Okay, so they don't really need to access the public markets because they don't really have needs for growth capital. Biotechnology is this shining exception to that because it still takes a lot of money to develop a uh, commercializable pharmaceutical. that ecosystem is uh, is a relatively small ecosystem that requires significant um, energy and effort to get inside. If you're an investor or you're a company, like getting inside that ecosystem is not an easy thing to do. But once you're inside it, there's a lot of collaboration and work around understanding what's likely to be successful and what isn't. Cowan already had, when we did our merger, a pole position in that discussion and debate. And if we've done anything, we've just tried to bring the capital markets around to say, hey, it's okay to come back in and create new companies here because we, we with the Jobs Act and a bunch of the regulation, uh, you c- we can smooth the path for a, num- a number of these companies to act access that capital base uh, and and survive. Uh, and so I'll just, I'll, I'll share with you this. There are about 4,500 publicly traded operating companies in the United States today. 300 of them are biotech companies that have come public in the last six or seven years. That's a remarkable mm. change. And, and you can tack it back to, you know, a number of things. I think the single biggest one of them is the passage of the Jobs Act, period that opened up people's idea that, hey, you can access the public markets for the first time in like a decade, that's a big change. So the goal is how do we take what's happened in this biotech uh, ecosystem and extend it beyond that? That's really the question that we're trying to answer. I mean, the Jobs Act may be one example in the work that you're doing with the SEC, another of places where Washington actually gets some work done, but in other places, it can be so hard to decipher. It makes you just want to like, Take out one of those old CDs and play a little Freddie Mercury. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. So we're living in strange times, Jeff. You write in a LinkedIn post about Trump trying to buy one island nation, a hurricane destroying another island nation, an island protectorate of China, Hong Kong, going haywire with protests, and a bunch of other calamities playing out against corporate profits being stagnant, global economic growth slowing, and the yield curve inverting. Your advice to an investor 
echoing Mr. Mercury, is to open your eyes, look to the skies, and see. Is what is happening around us, what's happening this morning as we open the newspaper and see how the president's visit to New York has gone, is this real life or is it a fantasy? You know, uh, first of all, it's both. Right. I, and I think that the purpose of my writing that, first of all, other than I'm a huge Queen fan, and I think that Freddie Mercury's voice is probably the most epic rock voice ever. My purpose in writing this is because this is what we do every day. You have to separate the reality from the fantasy. You know, Greenland is a fantasy. That's a, I don't even know how to even, so let's not spend a lot of time on it. The media isn't necessarily filtering particularly well. Uh, for us. And Twitter certainly is not a filter at all. Like you have to build filters for, for, for Twitter. I find that to be actually really hard. Uh, and so as a result, uh, oftentimes the people with the loudest uh, megaphones are the ones that get heard. And that may not necessarily be representative of uh, reality. They may, be, they may be espousing some phantasmical view of the world as they see it, or they may just be trying to uh, build their own brand by saying the most wackadoo thing. And so we as investors have to be able to say, okay, let's separate what's reality uh, and what's fantasy. And that's a framework that I think is really important. Uh, it's a reality that we have an inverted yield curve. It's a reality that we're having funding problems in the money market. Those are realities. That's not fantasy. That's real life every day. And we've got to think about what that means and what that means for uh, you know, uh, asset values and, and the ability to access markets and things like that. Those are things we need to do. And the purpose of my writing this was to, to basically say, take a step back. Uh, take a deep breath when you read the paper or however you consume your news. Um, go, do it proactively and say, okay, is this something I really need to think about or is this not something I really need to think about? When you do that, you see there's actually a remarkably few number of things you actually need to think about, right? And when uh, and you should focus on those and, and, and try to understand how those are going to make an impact in your portfolios or, you know, in your businesses. I mean, you have six things that you point out in that LinkedIn post from – Busting the status quo is the new status quo to spending by U.S. consumers and U.S. businesses will continue to be the most dominant indicators of health in the global economy. And there's five things in between. Curious, I don't know how much you enjoy sort of sitting in front of the computer, putting on a little Freddie Mercury and writing, but is that a, a good release and a good way of sharing your philosophy by authoring these posts and putting them on LinkedIn? You know, it's uh, it's cathartic and therapeutic for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm always uh, thrilled when when people want to read it, and I'm humbled that there's actually an audience out there that that consumes it. For me, it just gets loud in my head sometimes. Yeah. I think everybody, yeah. uh, you know, how is it not loud in there? You get bombarded every day with more than you could possibly process uh, as a human, and I, I just need to get it out. Right. So sometimes I write and I don't really send it around to anybody because it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then sometimes all of a sudden there's a parting of the waters and you're like, oh, this is actually what's happening here. And I want to share that with you because I think I've discovered something or I've I've, I've concluded something or I've, I can look around the corner and see something that I want to share with you or at least plant it in your head. And when that happens for me, I want to write. I write. It's not like I don't go home every night going, I got to write something. I don't, uh, and I don't do it uh, in any regular time frame. It's when there is a series of things that occurs that, um, and it gets loud in my head and I feel like I need to get it out. I mean, you've said, I've heard you say in the past that, you know, sometimes someone asks you, well, what do you do to sort of, th that is a total waste of time. And you were sort of challenged to come up with that, what that might be. You thought, well, maybe I'll go back into the backyard and smoke a cigar and reflect on the world. But I get a lot of work done when I do that. And I'm told that you also write these macro notes to your colleagues each week, often infused with the lyrics from bands that have had a big impact on you over the decades from Steely Dan to the Doobie Brothers. I mean, Jeff, you had me at Yacht Rock, but can the up and coming millennials relate to your leadership bromides leavened by Crosby, Stills and Nash? You know, I actually, uh, if you look at the, my playlist, it's on Spotify. People can people can download my playlist. What's it called? Uh, it's uh, Jeff's Macro Playlist. I think my Spotify username is uh, Solly1769. And you can see it there. It's actually not filled with things from my youth, per se. It's actually filled with a lot of modern music as well. I listen to a lot of music. I still sing in a band from time to time. I have kids that are in their... Uh, 20s and teens, so... Uh, Do you feel validated by having the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs be a disc jockey? Uh, 
I was a disc jockey before he was in the high school. Uh, but that aside, validated, I'm thrilled. You know why? I, I think it's super important. Like the, We are actually human beings. This idea that the imperial CEO that sits in some uh, secluded office, it comes down from on high and makes pronouncements. I mean, I, I think I grew up thinking that's the way it was. And I think there's still a lot of people in America that thinks that's the way it is. It isn't. Yes, I have hobbies. Yes, I love music. Yes, I love to sing. That's who I am. Just because I'm wearing the chairman and CEO title, that doesn't go away when that happens. And I think in David's situation, like he loves EDM. And just because he's now the chairman and CEO of, 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 of Goldman Sachs, that doesn't go away. Um, you know, and so kudos to him for you know, continuing to pursue that. It's wonderful. After the break, Jeff Solomon and I discuss Jeff's involvement in the SEC's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee, the current IPO climate, and how Jeff found himself not in Hollywood, but instead on Wall Street. That's right after this. It's more than an iconic building or a global financial marketplace. It's anywhere technology, commerce, and people intersect. The innovation that makes people's lives better. Dreams that were once impossible are now realities. At the New York Stock Exchange, we help tech companies flourish and change the world. So go ahead, bring those ideas to life. We'll bring it to market. We are Living Tech. Welcome back. Before the break, Jeff Solomon, chairman and CEO of Cowan and I were discussing the current state of the equity markets and the events swirling in the world around us. So let's go back to Pittsburgh one more time for 32 immaculate seconds. Last chance for the Steelers. Bradshaw trying to get away. And his pass is broken up by Tatum. Tipped up. Jeff, the Steelers over the Raiders, 13-7 in the 1972 divisional playoff game. The immaculate reception just voted by the NFL the greatest play in NFL history. Terry Bradshaw to Franco Harris. The team would go on to win four Super Bowls in the Chuck Knoll era alone. What did you learn about leadership from watching that team? I still get choked up when I hear that. Because uh, I listened to it on radio. That wasn't the radio broadcast. That's the TV yeah. version. But the radio broadcast I still hear from time to time. And it takes me right back to being six years old. The play was blacked out in Pittsburgh. In my own head, I, I, I had already had the play in my own head the way I heard it uh, way before I ever saw it. And, uh, and it, it, it is to me, it's, it represents um, a turning point. So, you know, Pittsburgh... Prior to that, the, the, the Steelers in particular were perennial losers, you know, 40 years of just never doing anything right. And it looked like that was going to continue. Uh, and in that moment, uh, everything changed. All of a sudden, it was like the ball could actually bounce our way in retrospect. And even though we had a lot of a tough decade ahead of us, uh, you know, from an economic standpoint, uh, there was always this um, there was this amazing uh, allegiance to to that work ethic, that ethos that that team represented. What I learned from that, and I've had conversations with you know Franco Harris about it. Fortunate enough to have met him and spent some time with him. You know, what that team represented was galvanizing. It didn't matter what color your skin was or, you know, what your religion was or whatever challenges you faced um, on the other seven, six days of the week. On Sundays, uh, we all got together and we did one thing and there was something incredibly bonding around that, that if I meet a Pittsburgher from whatever walk of life and we, we have nothing else in common other than we grew up in the 70s in Pittsburgh – uh, we have an instant bond, and we can go deep for as long as we want. 
that that is, I think, what's so great about sports, frankly, or what can be so great about sports, is that it teaches you that um, you know the way that humans can engage each other with one another to accomplish a goal, regardless of where they come from, uh, regardless of what they look like. Uh, the team aspect of that is really critical. And for me, you know, when we're building our team at Callen, or when we're talking to management teams about how to build their team. There's all of this learning that goes on into who you bring on and how you bring them on and the functions they perform and the fact that it's really every team is made up of individuals and individuals have different responsibilities. You know, and I'll say things like, you know, you cannot expect an offensive lineman to run a 15, you know, run 15 yards down the field really quickly and, you know, catch a ball. That That's actually the job of the wide receiver. But you know what? That wide receiver doesn't get to make that catch if the offensive lineman doesn't block effectively because the quarterback never gets to throw the ball. So, you know, when we are building our teams, we have linemen and we have wide receivers and we have quarterbacks and we have people who do things, all of which work together for us to deliver what we deliver. And that team, uh, more than any other team in my life, is emblematic of that. And it, and it showed that if you got the right individuals together around the right strategy and the right game plan, and the ball can bounce your way because, let's face it, luck is a big part of things. You can win a lot, uh, and then yeah, no, so for that, that for me, obviously, you know, for for most Pittsburghers, it's you know, it's a it's a real turning point. You were talking earlier about wanting to build Cowan into the investment bank and having the coverage of firms the way you yourselves wanted to be covered in the past. Larry Weisenek, who's the co-president of Cowan, called your firm a challenger bank, committed to offering a unique value proposition to your clients. How do you think you stand apart, whether it be M&A, capital raising, or investment strategy? Well, so, you know, Larry's right about that. And it's interesting, when I first met him uh, right after he left Barclays, you know, I instantly could understand that this is somebody who understood uh, exactly the challenges that I was facing as a leader and that understood our marketplace. And uh, he's the first one to teach me this idea of Challenger Bank. Uh, it is a bank that ostensibly ha- uh, blends the deep relationship, the interpersonal relationships that you can build in our business with the ability to execute at a high level. That's not an easy thing to do. And what I used to see in many instances is the bigger banks – um, they had definitely could execute because they could throw bodies at stuff and they had capital and they could, you know, if I could, get, if I could figure out a way to get them to do what I needed them to do, they were, they're always good at doing that because, you know, they're big and, and they have a lot of access. The problem was I wasn't really sure if the people on the other side of the table cared <laughs> about me or my business or they just wanted the fee. And I think that's what people's perception is. The flip side is for some of the smaller banks, I had great relationships, but then when I'd ask them to do something, you know, do they have the team? Do they have the horses? Do they have the execution capability behind it? Or, or are they just going to let me down? And I think for most clients, getting those two vectors to line mm-hmm. up is a really hard thing because you can't really see them. Uh, at Cowan, we're trying to not make that. We're, we're trying to not have you have to make that choice. You can have a deep and meaningful relationship, and not worry about execution. In fact, you can get top quality bulge-like, whatever you want to call it, execution, uh, unfettered um, at Cowan and have a deep and meaningful relationship. Uh, In order to be able to do that, you have to be able to be product agnostic. And this is a really critical thing. We, when we're giving advice to issuers or companies, we're, we're telling you what we think is the best thing for you. Many banks I saw gave me advice that was, you know, they, they thought it was the best thing for me, but it was sort of really the best thing for them because that's what they do best. And, of course, they're engaging me because they think there's a fee at the end of that. Our job is to give you the best advice. Uh, and then when you cho- choose uh, what path you want to go down, we have to be able to execute for you. We have to walk in product agnostic and, and give, give you the landscape, have a dialogue about it. Uh, there's also a supposition in that that um, we may not know best. We actually need to have the conversation, learn more, learn about you, understand your business dynamic. What we come in with may be the best idea, but then we learn something where we're like, well, actually, maybe this is really the best idea. And so you need to be in a position where you can deliver that. And so that's what challenger banks do. Uh, They figure out how to take 
uh, those deep relationships and build execution capability so that the clients on the other end of the table never have to worry about having both. Talking about the way you serve your clients, the desire and passion to serve others often crosses over into our day jobs. For you and for Cowan Inc., the natural cultural DNA can be found in what I think you call VEST, which is vision, empathy, sustainability, and tenacious teamwork, values that define how Cowan employees serve their community and clients and each other, certainly values that each of us can live by. Yeah, I mean, I, the, so it's interesting. We gave it a taxonomy. Right. I, I, you know, that was part of what we did. And I think it's important when you're scaling an organization to be able to label things that people can identify with. But if I'm being honest and candid, that was here at Callum before we got there. Just wasn't organized in a way that people could conceptualize it. Callan uh, and Ramius, both deeply empathetic organizations where the people in those organizations cared about outcomes for others and doing the right thing. You can't invent that. You either have it or you don't. You know, and Adam Grant talks a lot about this in his book, Give mm-hmm. and Take. Like, yeah, that at the center of all of these engagements is, uh, is the ability to re- relate to one another. We call that empathy. But you have to have vision. You can't come in and say, well, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. What do you think? Like, I, I want to hear what you think. You need to tell. Like, we have to debate, discuss. I want to see. Show me what you see. Show me your vision. Everybody. Right. And uh, and then sustainability is this idea that everything we do, um, we can leave a little bit on the table for the next opportunity. Right. We 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 can't. There's no such thing as a maximization strategy that's long term sustainable, in my opinion. It might work for a little while, but after a while, people are like, well, all those guys did was try to take the most from me. And I don't really want to do I don't want to do that anymore. You know, so when we think about sustainability, it's businesses that are sustainable, businesses that give back to, to the firm, to their communities, to their families, right? Those are the things that we try to, to, to get around. And then Tenacious Teamwork is just, you know, again, it sounds maybe different than a lot of other Wall Street firms. Although when you get below the surface, the ones that have been the most successful actually have a tremendous amount of collaboration, right? At the center of our success at Cowan is, is collaboration, our most widely read research pieces that we produce, with all the research that we produce at the quality we produce it, the most read are the most collaborative. We have that data. It suggests that we need to have research analysts on our platform who see the value of working with one another to create unique thought. So people ask me all the time, like, are you worried about you know AI or 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 machines coming and and and, and destroying the business? I'm like, well, last time I checked, machines don't know how to collaborate. They don't, they actually, you have to instruct them. They'll, they'll do a rules-based collaboration, but for the most part, unique thought is what we do for a living. Content creation is what we do for a living. That's human. And so I like to use machines to figure out a way to uh, create more time for people to think and come up with unique thought. That's awesome. Uh, But if they're not collaborative, they're probably not going to work in a place like Cowan. And so this idea of tenacious teamwork is really, you know, central to the execution of, uh, of some of our other values. One more trip back to Pittsburgh before we close. Another plane crash last night. Among five persons aboard, Pittsburgh Pirates baseball superstar Roberto Clemente. The person that he was still lives amongst the baseball community. I don't think I should ever die. And he took the platform of baseball and became a real humanitarian. Jeff Roberto Clemente died in a plane crash December 31st, 1972. He was delivering earthquake aid to victims in Nicaragua. The MLB now gives its Roberto Clemente Award to those who best exemplify the game of baseball, sportsmanship, community involvement, and the individual's contribution to the team. Clemente was 38 when he died. I heard you say that you embraced philanthropy through the UJA in a very profound way when you were 40. With many years behind you, but many years ahead, how are you trying to use your expertise and your wealth to make a difference in the world? You know, I I think we all have the power to do good. And money helps, I'm not going to lie. The better I do uh, financially, the more I get to do um, uh, philanthropically with money. But it doesn't matter where you are uh, in terms of your status and in terms of wealth. Uh, Every human being has the ability to make a positive impact in somebody else's life. It's just a matter of whether or not you want to uh, and whether or not you make an effort 
right? A lot of people want to do it. They don't know how to do it. Um, you know, we shouldn't overthink this. You know, I think people go, so oh, I'm not so sure how I can make the impact mm. I want to make. I'm like, listen, how about just start by making an impact right. and then see where that goes? And I think what Roberto did that was so incredible, and it seems so, um, I don't know, usual today, right? We see athletes uh, who have charities, and we have NFL charities and MLB charities, and all these things. Like, at the time, that just wasn't happening. And we didn't have, you know, big free agencies with big signing bonuses. Roberto was doing this because it's the right thing to do. And he was compassionate and empathetic, and he was using his status as a superstar to attract uh, others to figure out how to make a positive difference. And, you know, of course, the fact that he died doing that is the stuff of legend. And it's inspirational to all of us because, you know, in some level we make a connection. That, you know, are we willing to potentially give our lives in service of helping others? I don't think he made that conscious choice, but it turns out that's really what he did. So, you know, I asked myself the question, like, I don't have to give up my life to help others, so why am I not helping others? Like, I, that's something I should be doing. And I, I'll, I'll get back to, to you know, under, uh, to something that I think is sort of we talked about earlier. Like, why am I involved with the SEC, right? Right. I'm involved with the SEC because, you know, I'm the product of a small business in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My father left the steel industry in 1978. 41 years ago and he bought a small business with a partner and they went through ups and downs over the next 41 years and it sometimes wasn't easy sometimes he didn't get access to capital and sometimes he was over levered and sometimes the economic forces conspired to make it much more difficult on him and his partner and my family my mom and my brother and me and he survived and uh i i at some level i've heard all of those challenges and I'm like, hey, I'm actually in a position where I might be able to help people like my dad and mom by, by bringing capital to them, by creating a better environment for capital raising, by doing something that helps people like them. And so, again, it could be outright philanthropy or it could just be taking what you do and paying it back uh, or paying it forward based on the experiences that you had. That's a really um, powerful psychic thing to be able to do. And I'm thankful for it. So, you know, there's no worries it written that that you have to do philanthropy until it hurts. I think that's also a misperception that people have. I do philanthropy because it makes me feel good. I get a lot of psychic joy out of that. That's a little bit selfish, but I love that feeling. And so I just want to do more of it. And I think we've talked a lot about this at Cowan. And, and I think the business roundtable and all these things that have happened, we've been talking about this for a while. The better we do at Cowan, the more good we get to do. You define what that good is. Define it in your communities and in your family, the companies that we deal do business with, the patients that get access to life-saving pharmaceuticals because we financed uh, a biotech company that had a commercializable uh, therapeutic. That's remarkable. However you want to define good, as long as you recognize um, uh, it and do it, you know, you're putting yourself in a better position. And that should be inspirational for you to come in and do what you do every day so that you get to do the good stuff. And for me, philanthropy and, and social engagement, community involvement is the, that's the spoils uh, of all the hard work in the, you know, 30 plus years I've been in this business. Making a positive difference and finding psychic joy in business, philanthropy, and life Jeffrey Solomon, Chairman and CEO of Cowan, Inc., also the Vice Chairman and Inaugural Member of the SEC's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee. Thanks for coming back to the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for joining us inside the ISS. Thanks for having me. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Jeff Solomon, Chairman and CEO of Cowan, Inc. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Teresa DeLuca and Pete Ash, with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. 
Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 